show this slide that you see, I think it covers all that were involved and we have uh, um, had uh, uh, around about 140 uh, expected registrations uh, and is a significant component uh, of uh, nursing and uh, uh, professions allied to medicine. So, and also we should recognise our sponsors uh, and, and again back to yourselves, uh, participation from 12 European countries, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Iraq, Israel, Pakistan, Russia, uh, <coughs> Turkey, UAE and USA. I'm pleased to confirm that the UK is still in Europe today. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, something, uh, this is an area that if you read the, uh, uh, the British tabloids or the respectable uh, media and you think it was something that uh, this area has kind of evolved in the last few years and um, but we all know it's been around for several decades uh, but it has become the, the, the fastest growing indication for uh, transplantation across EBMT. To put things in, in proportion it's still only 2% uh, of transplants. So we've got some way to go before it becomes a, a mainstream indication that we see on, in every transplant unit. But take us back to, to take stock of what uh, um, uh, autoimmune diseases are. They're relatively common, they're much more common than a lot of the hematological uh, cancers and other diseases that we treat. Uh, they affect 5 to 8% uh, of the population, maybe more. Um, uh, MS is a relatively common uh, but disabling condition. Uh, one in a thousand have all got friends and maybe relatives with, with MS. Cure remains elusive. Almost all severe autoimmune disease patients require long term therapy. And it is this combination of the autoimmune disease plus the treatments that creates a sort of syndrome uh, that uh, results in uh, chronic disability, chronic reduced quality of life, and in some cases very significantly shortened life expectancy. The costs to the individual elements uh, through loss of work and the cost to society are also becoming more and more immense through the uh, expensive array of drugs that we use to treat autoimmune diseases. So there's still this on, or desire for a one-off intensive means of disease control and in some diseases at least there appears to be uh, increasing hope that uh, autologous transplantation and maybe allogeneic transplantation is that uh, holy grail, as it were. So, the concept of using auto, uh, transplanted autoimmune disease is not old, it's uh, now four decades old at least. I mean, there were probably some earlier animal models that uh, paved the way from Dirk Van Beckham, from Ikihara. Um, this is one from Richard, uh, dated 1995, which means the, the work you were doing, Richard, was several years before at least. So, this idea has been around for a while and there have always been these dual diagnosis cases coming through every transplant department where autoimmune diseases have been cured or remediated alongside a standard uh, transplant indications such as leukemia or rare plus leukemia. And in 1995, the first patients were treated with uh, 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 transplant specifically for an autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, I, I think some of these were uh, rheumatological patients, but the ones that were published as case reports subsequently were of MS from Greece and from uh, Chicago. And uh, in 1996 to 1997, the autoimmune diseases working party formed uh, with the proposal that there would be data, the database and the basis of guidelines. The guidelines were published concurrently in bone marrow transplantation and the British Journal of Rheumatology, now known as Rheumatology. And subsequently, we've uh, built on those guidelines with autoimmune disease working party specific guidelines. Um, and uh, sometimes covering specific areas of uh, transplantation, such as Sluriderma or the uh, immune reconstitution, Crohn's, and uh, most recently, uh, the multiple sclerosis and the mediated disorders. But importantly, we're in there in these general uh, indications, guidelines that the EBMT again published this year. 
uh, with multiple sclerosis and systemic sclerosis coming out as standard of uh, uh, care indications based on the EBMT classification for requiring randomised controlled trials. So, uh, the evidence has gradually moved up the scale, and but most importantly, what we need is the evidence to be within uh, the uh, disease specialist communities, and, uh, and so far it's only the rheumatology community that has really uh, embraced this, but we're working on ectrins and the neurological community to work with them so that they can produce combined guidelines. So there's still work to be done. This is the state of the database, thanks to Manuela, uh, who's uh, just joined us, and uh, uh, there are now over 3,000 patients in the database, which is a, 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 a milestone. Uh, um, as you know, most of them are autologous transplants, with a collection of all allographs, mainly in the paediatric group. Um, the uh, lead indication, as before, is multiple sclerosis, of which there are now more than 1,500 patients with connective tissue diseases such as scleroderma, uh, catching up. Uh, arthritis was something treated in the past, but there is an increasing number of uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients being treated <coughs> in on trials. And then there's the whole range of uh, autoimmune diseases in other specialties that uh, the registry is so valuable for. So this is the uh, graphical depiction of that, and this is the breakdown of the autologous transplants <laughs> within that uh, um, uh, 20 or 25 year distribution. And as you can see, uh, the main indications of multiple sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, and Crohn's in the blue, green, and red. It's changed over the years. You know, back in 1998, 1999, arthritis was a significant component, but medicine's changed, and we've got a whole range of anti rheumatic agents that obviate the need for uh, transplantation. Um, so, activity very much varies depending on the country. I think it depends on the, uh, the disease specific uh, uh, community acceptance of, of transplantation and its collaboration with haematologists. Um, there are some countries that appear to be particularly well provided. Sweden, I always put this slide up to please. You know, Birmingham and the, the, the Swedes because they have a small country but the uh, delivery of transplantation for MS, where, which is a common condition, is, is particularly effective. Um, in other countries, it depends where you are. Some have a more neurological focus, some have a more rheumatological focus. So, where are we in the uptake and delivery of uh, uh, transplant for autoimmune diseases? Um, well, this is the uh, Roger's diffusion of innovation bell. It can be applied to anything, to fire, the wheel, to the iPhone, IT. There's always the early innovators, the doctors, and then there's always the sort of doubters and the laggards. So where are we? I don't know whether we're at the top in 2019 to 2020, but it feels like we're on the cusp of something, a kind of watershed period where things are moving ahead. So we looked at the evolution trends uh, and economics of uh, transplantation in the registry a few years ago, and I think some of the, the increased interest in the, the disease uh, specialist communities is that we're, we're getting better at this. We're getting uh, improvements in progression-free survival. Uh, we're improving on non-relapse mortality, from treatment rates for mortality. I think this depends on increasing experience uh, and also the recognition that we're getting better at transplantation generally with uh, the rollout of JC accreditation and, and other factors. We're selecting the right patients. In years ago we were selecting the wrong patients for MS. It didn't matter how hard you treated them with total body irradiation, if there was no inflammation there was no response for patients. Sadly they got treated perhaps in retrospect inappropriately. Uh, but with time the, the EBMT registry and the CIBMTR registry uh, helped with uh, some of the scoping, it became clear that we had to treat the right patients with inflammatory disease at the right stage in their disease and there's been a shift, uh, for example, in MS to treating relapse and remitting disease and away from the, the progressive disease. And this uh, uh, shift was uh, uh, endorsed significantly with uh, the, the publication of the MIST <laughs> and the data uh, 
uh, in relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. We're selecting patients for safer transplantation. We recognise that some patients have a, uh, a high risk when they go through transplantation because of pre-existing comorbidities or pre-existing organ dysfunction. We've been selecting uh, patients uh, based on cardiopulmonary assessment uh, following the publication of uh, EBMT guidelines led by Dominic. Um, we, we hope that this will bring down the, uh, the, the treatment related mortality. And we're, we're also not selecting patients for transplantation for whom there are better therapies. Um, the room is full of urologists and uh, rheumatologists and other inflammatory specialists. There's been a revolution in biologicals. Some patients can be treated much more safely, much more effectively. And uh, um, we have to admit that uh, autologous or allergenic transplantation has been eclipsed uh, in some diseases by the modern therapies. Um, even so, there's an occasional patient that's treated with arthritis and, uh, and lupus and, and, and other uh, patients that don't get the, the fantastic response or they become resistant to biological uh, treatments. So how do we improve the evidence base? All of these ways are, uh, uh, are used to improve the evidence base. We've got to keep on moving, got to keep the momentum going. We've got a body of randomised controlled trials, which as a conventional mainstream hematoma-oncology transplanter. This is relatively um, unique, you know, there aren't many fields in hematoma-oncology and transplant that have really um, shown uh, the way through randomised controlled trials. Uh, and, and particularly in allergenic transplantation, which is very dependent on uh, registry data or, or single arm trials. So hats off to all those people, many of them are in this room, who've uh, <coughs> Produced this high level of evidence base uh, either in Europe or uh, in uh, uh, North America. So, it's this evidence base that helps to uh, raise the standard of uh, indications, recommendations uh, to, to something that's much more mainstream in the transplant community and, uh, and it also focuses the mind uh, on those challenges that we've got to. Uh, um, recognise where the evidence is deficient in some indications and work on trials, work on uh, prospective and retrospective analysis to improve the evidence base. So, the current questions for transplanted autoimmune diseases as far as I'm concerned and I hope as far as you're concerned is, is how, firstly, how much benefit over standard of care uh, does the transplantation provide? Uh, some of which has come from the modern DMTs, DMARD supporting care. Um, in MS, there's now 14 uh, uh, licensed approved disease modifying agents uh, uh, being produced that are highly effective in many patients. But we have got autologous stem cell transplantation alongside. We've got to do those trials with those modern agents. We, we can't use the agents that were there and maybe went a little bit out of favour or were superseded, we've got to do the, the trials on alentuzumab or ocrelizumab, for example, in MS. We've got to do trials in Crohn's and, uh, uh, and in other indications to prove uh, where autologous <coughs> transplantation lies alongside the, uh, the modern armamentarium of biological therapy. What is the best transplant regimen? Now, back in 1996-1997, a meeting in Basel uh, really just provided uh, four very basic transplant regimens, uh, BEAM, ATG, cyclophosphamide, ATG, TBI, uh, and cyclophosphamide and UCI based regimens. And I think those were what went into those original guidelines. It's sort of a bit embarrassing that that we haven't moved on. We, we've proven the principle using those regimens and yes, certainly we've got some favourable results, but you know, that was you know, 23 years ago, 22 years ago or so. Um, we need to think about modern ways of delivering this, uh, uh, the, the conditioning regimen and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the graph manipulation as well. But we need to think about how we address that. We need to think about uh, post-transplant care as well. So uh, th that's for the future. So what is the sweet spot? We're going to be looking at uh, uh, the uh, conditioning regimens in, in North 
multiple sclerosis in a study led by Ricardo Sicardi. Um, we're going to be comparing uh, how B mating G compares with cyclophosphamide 18 G, as there is uh, considerable numbers of, of, of both regimens in the registry. We don't know what the best regimen uh, to use in uh, uh, systemic sclerosis. It, 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 there's been three tremendous randomized controlled trials, um, all with varying results and with varying eligibility criteria. It's still the question of, of how to deliver uh, that, that uh, aspect in systemic sclerosis. So, still got work to do in the future. We, we've got some uh, excellent uh, biomedical scientific colleagues in the audience who are looking at methods of action. Toby is Paolo. Um, methods of action, why do we want to know that? As clinicians, we want to know that because we want to select the, the right patients, uh, I think, uh, with the biomarkers and our understanding of the biology can help us select the right patients or deselect the, the wrong patients. That would be great. We also want to know how to monitor these patients. Now, in hematoma oncology, post transplant monitoring of MRV or, uh, it, is, it has become routine standard of care. We want to know how to, to monitor these patients post transplant. The, on the custom relapse, we want to be able to intervene at an early stage. Um, in amongst these slides, we've got to recognise that, that there are uh, mechanisms of, of curing autoimmune disease, albeit at a cost, at a risk to patients, mainly restricted to paediatric patients, mainly restricted, I think, to uh, those diseases where there is an increased understanding now of the, the genetic component that mean that those diseases can only be really cured. Uh, so we work with the Inborn Errors Working Party and the Paediatric Working Party. And Raphael did this excellent paper that summarizes the present state of play. And in terms of delivering this treatment, whatever the indication, whatever the country, uh, uh, we need to think about health economics and, and policy. Uh, autonomous transplantation now stands up favorably against the, uh, the cost, the cost of a lot of the, the biological therapies which have to be given year after year. Um, if we can invoke a, 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 a permanent or a, a, a long temporary revision of disease activity, we can uh, solve the health economic equation. Um, in relation to that, the delivery of, uh, of transplant, as I've said, is very much country dependent. Uh, it varies between the national health care systems and to some extent I think outcomes are related to health expenditure. More work needs to be done in this uh, direction. I've just got this one little slide up here that refers to the NHS England. As you know, England and Scotland and Wales are a little bit uh, uh, separate. You know, it's a slightly divided country, but the, the health services are separate. We've had approval for MS and systemic sclerosis and Crohn's and a number of other indications since 2013. Um, Scotland uh, didn't have it at all, uh, and then no transplants. Hardly, well, very few times I've been in Scotland. But uh, with uh, uh, a review that went on in the last few months, uh, this uh, document was published. It was, it has been highlighted in, in such uh, media such as the Scotsman and the Herald and things like that. And uh, we as EBMT, as the working party, were able to have an impact on that decision, which will help all those Scottish patients that were. Deny access, at least free of charge, to uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the potential of uh, autonomous stem cell transplantation in that way. So we've got to keep on working. We've got to keep on working uh, so that uh, this disparity between different countries uh, is, is ironed out, so that uh, the access to these treatments is fair and equitable, uh, and patients aren't having to travel. Okay, so. Just to round off, we've got to think about quality assurance of the transplant centres. Um, this is provided through JC. This is a document that was just recently published about benchmarking. It doesn't include autoimmune diseases because it was a bit too uh, complex to consider the autoimmune diseases, but we do need to think how we benchmark centres for the quality of the care that they give. Uh, education is crucial, and uh, that's for specialists, that's for non-specialist clinicians, and it's for patients and carers. Uh, 
and we published this document to help everybody, uh, along with uh, having events, handbooks, reviews, uh, Toby's working on an e-portal for education, and, and we've uh, had these, these meetings, and I hope that we're going to contribute more to your knowledge base and we'll take it back to your centres and your home countries. So, in conclusion, autologous transplant is evolving into a standard treatment to be considered alongside modern therapy for summer autoimmune diseases. The future depends on the dynamic of the modern and future standard of care therapy, um, and it depends on the acceptance within the international and national disease and specialist communities, and we should have a goal of specialty society guidelines, either in combination with the EMT or better still if they go off and do it by themselves, I think. And, uh, so further studies are necessary to establish the relative benefit over standard of care therapy to establish the best transplant regimen for each disease using modern technologies rather than these drugs from the 1950s and 60s and, and those sorts of things. So to define mechanisms with, uh, and develop clinical biomarkers to select and monitor patients and to define the health economic benefits and the public health delivery across all our countries. And the allergenic transplantation is always going to be niche, there's an overlap with inborn errors, it's high risk, it's uh, uh, probably going to be restricted predominantly to paediatrics and young people. So I'll leave you with a couple of quotes. Uh, Treating autoimmune diseases by destroying and then selectively rebuilding the hemopoietic immune systems may not only uh, produce clinical benefits but may provide important insights into the pathogenesis of autoimmune immune diseases. Gradually, we've got to, we've, we've learned more and more. Uh, but now we're at the stage of implementation science, which is now needed to bring the field properly into routine clinical practice alongside alternative treatments in tandem with clinical science, health economics, and education. I'd like to acknowledge all those that have been active in the Autoimmune Diseases Working Party uh, and <coughs> others that have been associated with the, the output. Um, and I'll mention Sheffield because most of you won't have been there, maybe don't go there. <coughs> it's not really a, a tourist destination, so it's, <laughs> it's quite a nice place to live. <laughs> and it's famous for a number of things, but <laughs> I'll talk about them at dinner tonight. And uh, just to round off, uh, uh, these are the key contacts uh, within the Autoimmune Diseases Working Party, uh, having fish and chips uh, in, in, in London. Uh, so, thank you very much.